Welcome, everybody. This is the, the City of Bend Utilities Public Advisory Group meeting, the February 1st version. I uh, hope everyone is staying warm and cozy here, and it's a cold, chilly February. I'm Aubrey Koenig, facilitating here with the city team. Once again, we've got uh, Dan Denning is going to be our main speaker today, but we also have um, Elizabeth representing the Stormwater team, and of course, Lori as well. So familiar faces back in the room. Uh, just to, to get us rolling here, our conversation today is mostly going to focus, or the first half is going to focus on water conservation and the, the rebate program, customer engagement, getting your input there. And then we're going to um, take the, the second portion of the meeting. We cut our conversation a little bit short in January, so we wanted to make sure we got time to get everybody's input around talking with customers around the code enforcement. That was where we left things off. Um, in January, and we, we didn't quite get a chance to close that out. So we're leaving a little bit of space for, our, for that conversation in our meeting today. Um, and then we'll do a look forward at any other questions or reflections that uh, you guys have um, to share at the end of the meeting. So and the code enforcement part will be about both stormwater and water conservation in both of those areas. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, Great, so water conservation, rebates and incentives, you may have noticed in the agenda that we sent out, we snuck in a couple of examples of some customer outreach that is already uh, being, being used, some flyers about the rebate program. Um, where we wanted to spend time in the conversation today, this is just a preview, so you have this in the back of your mind as we move through the material. Uh, we're looking for your input on um, ways to drive engagement in the rebate program, uh, ways to, to connect with customers, what, if any, barriers to participation do you see in getting folks to participate in, in the program? Um, and also your, your views on whether community, how community demographics might be considered in, in directing those rebate funds and what you feel is most important to help measure the success of the rebate program. So keep those ideas in the back of your mind as we uh, move through the material. Over to you, Dan. All right, thanks, Aubrey. So uh, I know it's cold outside, but we can warm up and, and talk about some irrigation and, uh, and landscapes. That'll get us all warm and fuzzy inside, right? So uh, I think we'll start off with just um, kind of an overview of, of those 11 measures, uh, our incentives and our kind of code, um, landscape code that um, we were directed to, to implement uh, that we've talked about before with our WMCP and just this first slide is just kind of how we uh, so Dan WMCP water management conservation plan. <laughs> Thank you, Lori. Um, yeah, if I, by the way, if I say if I'm talking about acronyms and, and people don't understand what the heck I'm talking about, please just interrupt me. Uh, I, I've been working in government too long now and I tend to do that. Um, but this is our um, this is basically our internal look at what our rollout would be um, and what we're looking at here with all these colors and shapes is how we are going to phase our, our rebate programs and incentive programs based off of, um, you know, analysis and work that needs to be done for each customer category or each phase of the rebate uh, program. So uh, if you notice, uh, we've got kind of dates and, and um and phases up on the top bar. And so what we did is phase one was our single family residential. So we broke it out by our customer classes of single family residential, multifamily residential, and then commercial. So hopefully by the end of the third year, we've had a pilot phase of each of our customer classes. And by the fourth year, we have a, a standing, we've learned some lessons, we've done some analysis of what works and what doesn't. And we have a standing uh, rebate program that we can offer to all our customers, hopefully by the end of year four. Uh, following quickly that phase five is our update to our water management and conservation plan. So we have a progress report due halfway of the 10 year plan. Um, so then we're gonna take a deeper dive in the analysis and kind of compare where our projected savings met or on track with, um, you know, what we, what our results were, right? Uh, so that's kind of the deeper dive. Um, at the same time, those larger blue bars down here are our code discussions. So that's kind of the process that we're here talking about today with you. Um, so 
you know, having our internal talks with our, our groups in building and planning and then bringing some of these topics uh, to this group um, to get your feedback. Our plan is uh, by the end of these meetings, you know, uh, by May, June, we'll have some consensus to bring back to our internal folks and get working on that process of, of actually inserting our code and inspection um, actions into their process. Uh, next so, slide. So, Dan, if you don't mind, I, I just yeah. wanted to commend you on, I mean, this is Dan summarizing a huge program on one sheet, which is pretty amazing. And I think a good way to think about it is that the colorful stuff at the top is the carrots, and then the stuff, the blue stuff at the bottom is the stick side of the program, right? Oh, there so, you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got some rainbow carrots up there, which are delicious, <laughs> and then we've got the stick down at the bottom, right? Yeah. Um, Thanks, Lori. Uh, this is our internal look. So this is out of our implementation plan that we put together on, on how we were gonna accomplish all this. Uh, keep in mind, all this is work on top of our existing core programs. So this is all additional work for our, our group. Um, based off of our phases and the, and the types of rebates that we were um, going to start offering, this is our projected savings, our internal look at based on our capacity and what we're planning to roll out as far as numbers and savings on devices, here's our projected savings. Um, we'll, we'll take an annual look at this every year to see where we, um, where we hit and where we missed the mark and where we're on track. Um, so that'll be our kind of own internal look. Next slide, please, Aubrey. Um, and so the reason we're, we're another reason we're breaking this out is the, the water use patterns and uh, volumes are so different between all our customers. When you get into um, outside of single family residential, uh, essentially, the water use patterns and, um, and volumes just they're on a different scale. There is no singular pattern to follow of indoor versus outdoor use, right? It's really hard to tease out what's irrigation, what might be production water, what might be, uh, you know, a restaurant with a hotel, with a landscape outside. Uh, even our hourly water data doesn't tell us that. So we went through um, an analysis uh, early fall and, and in through winter of how are we going to know who our high water users are or the folks with the most conservation potential? And so we, of course, need that water data, but we also need things like building age, uh, number of units per site for multifamily, um, you know, uh, affordable complexes. Uh, we want to make sure that, you know, we are offering this program initially. Uh, we're engaging the folks that need to take advantage of this. So we did, uh, we basically normalized the water use to uh, a gallons per year per unit so that we could kind of compare all of our multifamily customers on some sort of similar scale. Um, and then we um, basically came up with three different lists of, of uh, our top customers. And so we had 100 people that we were our top priority customers and we looked at those three lists of average water use, unit uh, use, and we said, who is, the, who is the reoccurring folks in all these lists, right? And then made a final uh, aggregate list of all these folks. Uh, so these are essentially our top 100 customers, multifamily customers that we want to recruit into the program. Um, and we took it a step further and did some mapping. And so we looked at it through different lenses of poverty level, um, uh, disabilities. Um, so that's this background map you're seeing here. Uh, so we tried to look at it through a couple different lenses, again, to make sure we're talking to the right customers, but also to help us shape our messaging, right? Um, we wanna make sure that we are appealing to the community to which we're, we're um, engaging. And so what you're looking at are the all the dots are customers uh, based on the, the shade of red and the size of the dot, uh, the larger the dot and the darker red, the higher water use per unit they were. So you can see this aerial Glen that we've got highlighted. Uh, they were ranked 44 out of our top 100. 
um, and um, the the background shades of purple there are their percent of um, uh, poverty level in that area, right? So this darker shade might be an area that you know we want to really uh, highlight the economic benefits, right? Uh, not only to uh, of the water savings, but the monetary savings might be important to those folks, right? Living on a limited budget. So uh, we had other lenses to look through. Um, some of our data team wasn't comfortable with us using those um, other than to help us engage through communication. Uh, but obviously there's, there's a lot more lenses we could look at this through, but um, uh, these are just a few that we took. Uh, any questions on that? I know I was kind of all over the place trying to describe that map. <laughs> okay, uh, next slide, please, Aubrey. Uh, so the way that the process is currently going to go, so this year, again, we're uh, looking at multifamily uh, customers. So uh, the application process and our workflow process is all going to be done through our water use portal. Um, because we have the ability to engage and communicate with and create forms and track workflows uh, through our water use portal, it makes it really easy for our customer to just go into their forms, uh, click on the form or the application that they'd like to uh, submit for, fill it out, and from that point on, it starts a workflow process that notifies us of an application. Um, we can correspond and receive documents through this portal. So it, for us, it makes the administrative uh, process really easy. Um, the only recognized hurdle with this is they would obviously have to log into their account in order to be able to fill out and submit an application. Um, we try to encourage people to do that anyway, just so they can be cognizant and take a look at, know what their water use is and, and takes um, uh, advantage of some of the benefits of, of, you know, the leak detection and things like that. So we're hoping that's a win-win. Uh, it seemed to work out just fine for our single family residential program last year. Um, and it shaved off, uh, you know, the need for any costly software or um, additional software or um, learning curve uh, on staff for being able to um, administer these rebates. Um, so right now, we're limiting it to one rebate per site for this pilot phase. So the site could be, um, when we're talking about the site, it's more of a tax lot. So you might have multiple buildings and multiple meters on a site. Um, but the uh, the rebate is going to go to that a water account holder, right? So one site, uh, one rebate per site. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about what the rebates look like on the next slide, I think. Ready for that? Yes, please. So what we did is for the sake of uh, staff time on inspections, um, you know, when we're we're offering these large sums of money, we want to make sure that number one, uh, there is some, we want to ground truth the savings potential, right? Um, and we also want to make sure that things uh, that were installed made an improvement in water use. Um, and so for multifamily customers, once they submit an application, we'll, um, we'll schedule a, a pre-site meeting, right? So we're meeting with the facilities person or the property manager or the site representative uh, to look over the application. Um, for outdoors, we're going to do some initial efficiency tests. Uh, on the proposed areas of retrofit for the indoor stuff, we're going to be spot checking a few uh, vacant units we thought was the best way. So we're not putting folks out uh, to make sure that, you know, the device is being replaced or there's actually going to be an improvement or, um, or some savings there. Um, so the way it'll work is any multifamily site, so like a duplex or a triplex, um, anything four units and under is going to apply through our single family residential rebate program. It streamlines it. All we do is ask for the application, a receipt and photo documentation of the new device. That limits the amount of staff time we have to do to go out and inspect two toilets at a site, right? So 
anything five units and larger is going to go through the multifamily uh, rebate program application. Um, the rebate amounts are set per device with a cap of $4,000 per site. So they can mix and match indoor, outdoor, um, or all of one or all the other uh, with a cap of $4,000. And the rebate will come back to them as an adjustment on their water bill. Uh, so we're working with our billing to make sure that any remaining amount after a billing cycle rolls through and, and gets paid off over multiple cycles if need be. Um, looking at most of the um, the water bills for most of these sites, it shouldn't be an issue. Uh, we're not going to be dragging things on for more than a month or two. Um, okay, so I think any questions on the rebates? Okay. I think it's important to, just for everybody to, to re remember. So this is rate payer money paying for this, but it, it's with the thought that we spend this money now we save a lot later. So that's that that's the whole deal here. This is this is city ratepayer money. This isn't money we're getting from somewhere else for these rebates. Mark? Mark? Yeah, could I ask a quick question on that point? Has there been any calculation of how much savings there is per any of these? Um, I know I, I've done some of that work for Seattle and Portland in the past, but um, and I'm guessing may, maybe are these amounts borrowed from programs elsewhere? Um, and sort of thinking about some of that relative component of some of the differences. Yeah, no, good question. So the the amounts that we're offering uh, for this rebate, um, we th these are the costs that we modeled in the initial conservation analysis. Um, so when we were looking at the the potential savings, we plugged in, you know, a per unit rebate amount of what you see here. Um, and yes, that was largely based off of, you know, what kind of the the uh, the national trend was for these. Uh, we fall, uh, I would say on average, uh, there are obviously some that are getting outside like federal funding or state funding for rebates. And then the utilities will add another chunk onto that. Um, you know, and actually have a, probably a more uh, enticing rebate than we do. Um, but uh, we're going to start off with what we modeled and and what we can afford with the, the monies we have at hand. And and when you say you, you modeled it, then, um, the, and I'm sorry if I missed that, do you think you, you have estimates of how much can be saved and the value of that cost savings? Yes. Yeah, so I would have to look at the individual uh, items, but essentially the the amounts that we used and the rates that we distributed them with equaled that savings um, that equals the twenty one million. Gotcha. Thanks. Yeah. But yeah, if you're interested in the uh, the details, that's that's something we can follow up on. So Dan, maybe just clarify so that there's a potential of. $21 million in capital savings, is that right? If if you achieve the targets in the water conservation program? Correct. So the the uh, water volume amount saved was roughly uh, 7,900 million gallons, which equated to about $21 million over the 20 year period uh, with these rebate amounts and uh, the volume of uh, devices going out. And we'd spend about overall about half of that savings to right, put right. the program in place. Yeah. Amy I see Amy Jo up there. With... Yeah, you you probably already said this, but just to recap again, when when would this these types of rebates be available for sing, single family residences or is that already an option? So that's already an option. We piloted that uh, last summer. Uh, we started with outdoor devices since we had kind of uh, a pathway through our existing like outreach programs. So we could market that, you know, we're already on site at a residential uh, home during a sprinkler inspection. We've already got the test data. If we we saw someone with, um, you know, savings potential there, we would cross market and offer them to take uh, part in the rebate program. There was also some outside marketing um, with, uh, with some of the controller companies that were uh, letting people know on their website that we had rebates available. So we did see some applications come in from 
outside of our own efforts. Um, that will be again offered um, this year. So we're kind of building and adding customers as we go sequentially through the phases. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Molly. Thanks. Um, Dan, to go back to that slide that you had that had the, the graph of the like the potential water savings through the pro yeah, this one right here. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the landscape code, how that shows on 24 and 25, is that water savings through the enforcement of that landscape code that you're anticipating? So the <laughs> the uh, we have enforcement already so that's kind of an existing core program the landscape code referenced here was the new landscaping code for private development so that's the assumed water savings off of this um you know new developments being built to this higher standard okay so um, we're we're hoping that yeah that in that uh you know next by next fall hopefully we're hoping that we have that in place so Nothing retroactively, but it would be from next, you know, fall moving on that we have that code hopefully in place. And so new developments, new review processes are using that new standard. Okay. Um, kind of going to like one of the, the things we're thinking about of like barriers to this whole program mm -hmm. is the whole separation of their city of Bend residents who, whether they're water customers or not, they pay the stormwater and the sewer yet they're not available, they're not, you know, um, eligible for the rebate programs and such. But in all this communication and education and outreach and stuff is really going towards the city of Bend water customers. And then all of a sudden, you know, Avion and Rotes and everyone else is gonna be held to those codes as well, where it's like, well, where was the, is there gonna be that same kind of education and outreach to those other water users because to the people who live in this town they don't they don't really know that they don't see that and especially when they still have to pay the the sewer bills um mm -hmm. you know because technically they could they could get a code um violation if they're you know going into the storm drain but they don't get any help with how to conserve that in their landscape to begin with yep so there's a couple different answers to your question there <laughs> but i get Sorry, what you're saying yep nope so um for the pilot phase, we were doing water only, right? Because these are water funds. Um, you know, we're looking for water savings. And yes, there is a benefit to the sewer customer as well. Um, but for the pilot phase for this first year, we're targeting water customers only. Um, when we get this into kind of more of a permanent uh, fixture, and right now we are having those talks with our franchisees. So, you know, we are talking about, you know, um, aligning our messaging, at least on the, for this year, we've had talks about aligning our messaging for the code enforcement piece of how that's going to benefit our community. You know, we can, we can find a happy medium of, of how our operational needs and um, our code enforcement efforts align between ourselves and the franchisees being Avion and Rhodes. We've already got some initial agreement from them of that's something they're willing to do, you know, for like irrigation hours and days and enforcing water on the street. Um, the rebates, that's a different question because they've got to put the money up for that, right? right. And so I think that's a bigger conversation, uh, but it's something we have broached with them. Um, well, even the enforcement is a bigger conversation because... Yeah. The enforcement we're talking about in the street right of ways, like if you see water running off the site and going down the, the gutter, um, that's City of Bend doing that enforcement. That that's not that's not Avion or Rotes doing that enforcement. They're they're fine with us, you know, enforcing our code because our code for the right of way applies citywide. Um, and we see benefits uh in those areas, in addition to our own areas, because for instance, like then, then maybe there's less pollutants being carried to the storm drain type type stuff going on. But um, it's a complex discussion with these franchisees who are are governed by somewhat different rules by public utility commission and who have their own boards. And um, we're 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 working on it. Um, yeah. 
fair enough. So, so to your point though, Molly, I mean, when you're looking across the city and, and being fair, yes, we want to treat all our customers the same, but we are paid, you know, our, our, uh, our funds that pay our uh, staff, um, you know, we have to look at that too. And are Absolutely. we paying ourselves to do someone else's work? And so that's where we're trying to come to agreement with these franchisees is right. what are we willing to do right now? What are we willing to do long-term? Because we do have to get on the same page. And those landscape code standards will apply to any new home, no matter where it's built, what service area it's built in. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. I'm going to sneak us back. Uh ready for the marketing discussion, Dan? Yes, please. All right. So, you know, part of this, you know, it's great to have all these rebates and incentives, but we have to, to Molly's point, educate the public, right? So if people aren't aware of the code or the rebate, we're, we're gonna be limited in our success. And so this is the other side of things that, you know, we're working on uh, in addition to just the programmatic side of the, uh, the rebate applications. Um, so we're working with uh, some media consultants to put together, you know, more communications, more multimedia uh, outreach, so that people are aware of not only the rebates but of our code. Um, you know, the direct marketing goes right to the engagement of of those notifications and that invitation of those top 100 customers that we'd like to apply into the program. Um, but it's certainly open to anyone who finds out about the program and is interested, right? Um, so some direct marketing there. Um, we will have signage, you know, uh, marketing with the big box stores where homeowners might buy these devices. Um, you know, we really, we need to be upfront and, and recognizable uh, in order to move the amount of um, uh, rebates that we need to move to achieve our goal. Um, so that's, you know, part of what we'll look at too in our year end evaluation is, you know, what type of marketing was successful, where can we improve, um, you know, those are things, you know, we're open to hearing from this group too, you know, have we missed anything here? Um, you know, typically a lot of our communications were done in that second to last bullet, uh, with the city communication channel. So our social media, our newsletters, et cetera, um, you know. In this group, it sounded like everybody had heard our messages, um, which was kind of interesting. Um, we weren't sure how effective those were. So that was good to hear from this group. Um, also, we're meeting with our housing department. Um, so the folks that are working on uh, low-income housing, uh, multifamily developments, to try to find some, some synergy in, in uh, outreach channels there. Uh, I saw... A question came in the chat from Tom, or maybe just a comment. I'm not sure. Just a comment. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I, I didn't want to interrupt your flow. It's great. It's a great no. list. I just threw in there the thought. The first thing that came to me is uh, plumbers who are already in people's houses. If they have, if they're on board with this and they have a flyer or something, or even an example, uh, or could even do the work, perhaps that might be a stretch. But um, having having the plumbers be an advocate to say, hey, uh, I noticed that you've got high flow shower heads and faucet heads. Uh, the city of Bend has this rebate program. Consider this as an option. Excellent. Yeah, those are all all things, uh, you know, the industry, right? Landscapers, uh, plumbers, um, management companies was another one we thought of. Um, okay. No, this is great. Uh, Aubrey, do I have one more slide? Yes, we've got one on tracking and management. Here we go. Thank you. Um, so, like I said before, um, we're we're trying to get your thoughts on you know how we measure success. Um, you know, outside of the obvious water savings, um, you know, again, we're doing that high level annual water use. Um, you know, one of the benefits to using our our customer portal is not just the engagement and the communication aspects, but you know, as people apply, we've already got kind of a list of folks that, you know, we've got water use in there. We can start tracking them as they progress through uh, the post install um, timeline. So we'll kind of have a running total of, of water use prior to and, and after retrofits. Um, 
And it, this is a learning process, right? These are the first rebates that you know we've had. We're we're trying to uh, accommodate everyone and and do the best that we can, um, or um, you know frame things that you know past experiences that we've learned through our programs dealing with the public. What we think is going to be the most beneficial, but we'll have to wait and see, right? Uh, we're giving it the uh, the old college try here. Um, and then the benchmarking, you know, so one of the, uh, you know, the typical benchmarks for conservation programs is our gallons per capita per day. So we're going to be looking at that, of course, that's how a lot of utilities and, and conservation programs compare themselves. There are some, you know, um, uh, nuances to that. Uh, not every city is the same, but that is the best uh, kind of number to use uh, across the board when you're talking about utilities. Uh, and then our participant growth, you know, are we seeing increases in customer participation, uh, obviously identifying what that was attributed to, you know, better communication, um, you know, I think Mark, your point, you know, with the, the amounts for the rebates, you know, we want to look at, did we model the right amount, right? Is this rebate not sexy enough? Um, so those are things we're going to look at as well. And then of course, you know, uh, the ins and outs, you know, what did we spend to get that water saved? Is it as uh, efficient as it, as we're hoping? Um, and then at the end of the pilot phase, you know, again, we're going to take that more in-depth look and basically do another analysis, um, you know, similar to the scale of what we did uh, in the planning of the WMCP. Uh, so we're going to put all the inputs back into um, that model and rerun it with um, our actual results. I think that's the last slide on the rebates. Okay, we've got questions. Thanks, Aubrey. <laughs> so I'm, I'm gonna share these on the slide. I'm actually gonna take the slides down here in a minute, but um, we're gonna just you know take a few minutes if you have other suggestions, the, the idea around uh, you know maybe focusing a bit on the, um, the landscape contractors and folks who might be in a good position to share and drive participation. Um, if you have other thoughts on what might encourage uh, recruits, as Dan called them, um, or barriers, as, as Molly was alluding to, of what might be a, a challenge to participating in one of these programs. Um, also interested in, in views, Dan shared a bit about how demographics are being considered um, in targeting the rebates and incentives, um, if you have thoughts on that, or anything about measuring the program. And I'm going to uh, get us back so we can see each other's faces a little bit easier here. Um, but I wanted to preview these questions. Amy Jo. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering, just I'm thinking of my own program area, if there is like a little media clip, some sort of marketing material that I could easily put in the newsletter that I send out to my clientele or put on our, our Facebook post or whatever. You probably have that already. I just, if there's an easy way to access that or it be sent to us so that we can help promote this program. Absolutely, Amy Jo. Um, we are actually in the process of creating that. Uh, part of this, you know, is like we want to kind of create almost, a, dare I say it, a brand around the program so that it is recognizable. People know it's from the city of Bend. They know what it's about. Um, so we're in the process of doing that, but um, are hoping to have that, you know, before we, we roll out in the spring. So yes, I would greatly appreciate that if you have the ability to, or the channel to get that out to more folks. I have a question about the equity stuff. Thinking of your map that you had with the demographics and, and the percentages of people living under or below the poverty level, the rebate program's great. And I'm wondering if it's gonna turn into an ability to pay things um, like $4 per nozzle for MP rotators. Those are expensive and those um, limited spray heads are expensive also. And even though there's a re rebate, uh, some people with limited economic ability to buy those in the first place, it, you may not get very good response from that. So I was wondering if there, it would be possible to maybe have, have a sliding scale on that rebate program and help some low income people with maybe, you know, 75, 80% of the cost, something like that. Um, just kind of 
make it a little more equitable across uh, different economic factions. Uh, Rick, yeah, I mean, that's that's something, uh, you know, that's actually a good topic too we should talk about on code enforcement as well, right? Um, I think for the pilot phase, we're going to try these numbers. Um, but, you know, one thing that we've thought of, especially with, you know, like the commercial side as well, is there's a lot of like pay for performance, right? So uh, there's a higher percentage of reimbursement. Uh, some of them are 50 to 75 percent typically, um, but it's more on a um, a project scale. So it's not just you buy the device and we'll give you some cash. And it's, you know, we take some sort of action, whether that's just better management or that's, you know, replacing some devices. But we're really looking at the savings to um, uh, calculate how much is is reimbursed. But uh, that's a good point. Um, I think, uh, you know, I know there's some programs out there that will pay like 100% for a plumber to fix a leak, you know, for low income folks. Uh, so we've looked at some things like that. Um, eventually, we could get there. Start. Yeah. Um, Mark? Yeah, th thanks. Um, I'm curious, do you think you're able to um, estimate or communicate the cost savings to the private participant. I know it sounds like we've got the information how much the city is going to save, but to sort of um, give some sense of the the payoff mm -hmm. to the investment by the, the private individual. Um, and also thinking part of that, and that might go towards uh, Rick, your point as well. Um, part of it might be communicating how much of the um, average or expected total cost is being subsidized. If someone hasn't looked into what each of these items actually cost. And you might start to see some of those differences. And I'll just say um, on the side, I've, I've done some work for EPA on this, where we look at the mix of public and private benefits in these kinds of water quality and water supply rebate systems and how we can see what the willingness to pay is for any given investment as a function of how much of the benefit of that implementation is private to the individual putting in place versus to the public, to the utility of the community and sort of showing what all the benefits are, sort of recognizing where there's a big private benefit and it's not necessarily just cost savings. There could be other kinds of private benefits, you know, things like rain gardens and that it's, it's easier to think about, but here there might be some as well, you know, sort of a more, uh, you know, less flooding on their property or, um, you know, less spray onto the sidewalks and driveways. I'm thinking about the things in our system that would be nice to have. Um, just, just thinking about ways to help motivate participation and remove some of the uncertainty of what participation means and communicate those those private benefits as well as the public ones. Yes, that's a good point. Um, so the the first part of your question was, um, you know, conveying the, the water saved. That was the purpose of um, the initial uh, pre-inspection. You know, if they applied for X number of, let's say, toilets or shower heads, uh, it's pretty easy to verify if they're switching from 103 gallon per flush to a 0.8 or a 1.28. We got some fixed savings there. On the outdoor side, we have ways of evaluating just through irrigation efficiency, um, you know, and looking at a pre and post uh, irrigation efficiency change. We can uh, project a potential outdoor savings provided, you know, there's ongoing management. Um, so yes, we're we're able to give them a, a theoretical ROI with the pre-inspection. Um, the second part of your question or comment was really cool. Um, I, I was I was talking about sort of, and and I think I think you're getting to it, but just sort of more of a long-term thing as we start to watch what those benefits are that people see from this, helping to communicate it. Yeah. Um, you know, because there can be unexpected ones, you know, even involving wildlife and that. And I remember when we were doing some of this rain garden work, or, um, people like that they had some butterflies and birds showing up in their yards for some reason. But I, I don't know if we've got anything like that here, but where there are additional benefits that start to accrue, it'd be nice to keep track of those. And I even, like that idea of having something to hand out that says that's maybe like some examples, like, you know, for a for a, a house that they did these things, they got these kind of benefits for a commercial that did these things, they got these kind of benefits. That, that's kind of, a, that's a cool idea. Mm -hmm. 
I think yeah. Rick Martinson would have some examples on existing landscapes that have, have been installed for a long time that we could, we don't have to wait to create those to get the data. I'm pretty sure we already have it. We just need to compile it. Yeah, no, that's that's great. Pointing people in the direction of, of something they can go see versus, you know, a photo in a book. Um, no, that's great. And yes, I think, you know, a lot of these retrofits, when we get into, you know, the next evolution of these as well, and we get into more of the landscape transformation, right? So maybe that's, uh, again, a bigger dollar amount, but it's addressing uh, the whole site or a, or a larger portion of the site. Um, you know, I think that's where you will see a lot of those those benefits to code enforcement, to the waterway side of it. Uh, you'll still see those to some uh, aspect here. I mean, that's why we're pushing the drip conversion kits, the things like that, trying to address retroactively kind of that street strip. Um, and then there's also lots of resources, you know, from local designers and landscapers who are already kind of doing this, right? Molly and Rick, you guys are both on here, you know, um, you could probably, you know, point out five to 10 sites right now that people can go look at. So, um, yeah, that's that will definitely be part of maybe the collaboration we can have um, with the green industry and and those uh, those experts on conveying that messaging. So, uh, OK, Corey? I think I saw Corey and then Barb. Great, thanks. Can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I just appreciate the rigor and thought that's going into this program and the rollout. Um, in terms of, you know, driving participation and, and some of the questions posed here, just to piggyback off of Mark and some of, and Molly, um, I think that like there's like a storytelling element here that would be helpful, right? That it's like really picking somebody like we're that's how we're programmed to receive information is like through a story. And so by featuring some voices that have gone through this program and achieved really great ends, right? Like this is what this meant for our bottom line and our single family household, right? Like, and these are the groceries we're able to buy and these are the things we're able to do with that money, right? Like it's more about like that end result. It's this thing that we did upstream that led to this kind of downstream impact, right? That I think like is important to frame this out as, right? So that like, you can focus in on those success stories and like, so then people relate and see themselves of like, wow, like that could be me, like that could be us by doing this, participating in this, this program. Um, I also felt like the city council's goals that they're setting for the next couple of years, like a lot of them are conservation focused and climate focused and kind of like the drought issue. And so I do feel like pushing leadership to kind of fold in and share programs like this in press releases or pitches to say, hey, like here's, you know, here's how our city's really like tackling these things head on, right? For for you, the individual, for you, the citizen in Bend. Um, so I think there's an opportunity there to just get more eyes and more, like win more hearts and minds to what's going on by connecting it to some of those bigger goals and, and really getting the comms team at City of Bend to kind of make those pitches and have this featured in, in news outlets that people listen to and follow and, and look to. Um, and then just a few other kind of specifics like neighborhood associations, I'm sure this is on your radar, but like getting this in front of, you know, those folks so they can bring it to their members and share it with their neighborhood associations and then partner organizations that are focused on conservation, like the environment or environmental center. Um, those are kind of like good other trusted voices to potentially partner with to help um, get the word out. So just wanted to share a few of those thoughts. Thanks. Nice. Thank you, Corey. Barb. Hello, I am Barb, and I don't know how many of you I've met, but I've been on the um, Stormwater Advisory Group for as long as it was in existence. So um, now transitioning to this group and getting to know what's going on, but this is really fun. I'm a I'm a recovering water quality professional, and now I'm a voiceover artist. So I am in the business of storytelling. And the whole um, aspect about, you know, what are the what are the things we can get out there on social media, um, just short little like 15 second blurbs or something like that. Um, I'm actually on a, a new social media app that limits you to 30 seconds of audio. And um, so I'm always looking for short little 
things that, that I can encapsulate and give somebody a, a good tip, you know, so I would encourage you to, to come up maybe with a whole list of just what are some short little quips that people could get out on their social media. Um, and I would love that because I would use it. Um, and then the other thing that I was thinking, just because I walk through the neighborhoods a lot, and I also had the experience of having my road rebuilt, I think two summers ago, um, is how what's the interaction with public works or the road department? I can't remember what they're called now. Um, because there was one instance where they rebuilt this section of road and they ended up putting in, instead of just putting in a Xeriscape or just a rock or making it concrete or whatever, they put in literally a two by two patch of grass that was surrounded by curb that has to be irrigated, that has to be mowed, and it's impossible to maintain because it's a two by two patch of grass in this concrete bucket. Um, so I just throw that out there. I have no answer. <laughs> but what is the connection with what Rhodes is doing, especially in that landscaping strip that what's typically right next to the road there? Mm -hmm. um, and because I know that I'm working on getting rid of my grass in that little parking strip and trying to move. I have a my house and my vacation rental house, and we're trying to move more towards xeriscaping. So what are the what are the the ways we can get in, in dice, uh, mm, Sorry, I do speak for a living. Entice people to move that direction. So, sure. anyways. Those are a couple questions, a couple thoughts. <laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate it. The um, the short quips is good, right? We're all we're all so busy that you know we've got fifteen seconds, seconds of attention. Here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so no, I appreciate that, and and we'll definitely follow up with you on that. Um, I think that's something that as we come up with these commercials and and media, that we could easily uh, provide something. Um, as far as the streets. Uh, yeah, they were public works. Now they're transportation and mobility. Um, huh. They are somebody that we work with. Um, you know, we are departmentalized. So they're, you know, general fund, different operations than utility. But we do partner with them uh, during the summer months because they have so much landscape, so much right away to maintain on a skeleton crew. And um, so part of our efforts is helping our ourselves. I'm not sure why they put in a um, a patch of turf there, unless it was like a contractor doing the work. And it may have been. I, I, I'm not sure um, what the pro where the project was, how it was yeah. being managed, and all that. There are no signs. Because so. that that's scary to me. That was like the one area of code where we did make progress was our capital projects and our right of ways that the city was installing were you know Zarek on drip and not turf. So that's something that we've got written in. Um, but I know I've seen uh, loopholes with like ADA installations where they've done like a repair to existing or something like that. Mm. Um, so again, it's just, it's getting our own house in order as well. And that was one of the challenges with code enforcement, right? Is like, we need everybody on board moving together. So um, I'm actually meeting with their, their manager next week to talk about <laughs> some of our code enforcement stuff. So I will bring that up, but uh, yeah. yeah, for the most part, as a city, I think we're far enough um, through this that most people know kind of what we're expecting and what we should be doing. Um, you know, it's a matter of bandwidth of people being able to inspect it and and get out there um, and or convey that to a contractor, right? Um, but no, I yeah. appreciate that. I appreciate that. We're all looking at the same things when we're driving around there. <laughs> Great. I'm going to maybe transition us. These conversations are linked for sure, but we did want to circle back to uh, talking with customers about code enforcement. That was where we left the January conversation. We've dipped our toe already into that um, and getting some input here today. Uh, but we have a few slides that we were going to provide just as a kind of a quick refresher um, on that content. So I'll pull those back up. And Dan and Elizabeth, if you guys want to just um, share a little bit here and, and get the conversation rolling again. 
I can lead, I guess. Uh, so our city code, uh, just a quick recap, our, our water use code or our chapter 14, um, the basics um, are basically telling folks, you know, uh, for operational reasons, you know, watering even odd days based on your address, the watering hours. So no watering uh, between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. Uh, irrigation runoff, so dry flows or, or irrigation water leaving the property or running onto an adjacent property is prohibited. Um, and then there is a timeline uh, for repairing leaks or making progress to repair a leak um, if you're aware of it. Uh, we do a pretty good job of, of leak notifications um, and helping people try to isolate it and, and find out where it is. Um, and then mostly we're referring them to a uh, a plumber to get that fixed. Um, there have been cases where we've had ongoing leaks and the property manager, you know, didn't think it was a big enough issue uh, bill wise to fix. And uh, so we have leveraged code in some of those cases to um, to get those taken care of. And then for the stormwater side of uh, city code, pretty much everything falls under Title 16. Um, and the main, the main concepts in that section are to prevent any type of pollution to storm drains, whether that be storm drains that flow to the Deschutes River or um, dry wells or drill holes that infiltrate groundwater. So basically everything in that code is meant to protect um, basically stormwater quality through, whether that's through construction, um, construction projects, whether it's through uh, businesses that have to dispose of certain materials in proper ways. Um, that's kind of where all of the, the stormwater code falls. Um, and if you've, you may have heard the saying, only rain in the drain, that's the overarching uh, concept of kind of the, the goal of the stormwater code is to keep everything that goes to drains clean. Um, and then for code enforcement on the stormwater side, uh, I think we might have gone over these slides last time, but as a reminder, uh, the process usually starts with identifying a problem, and that usually will come through either a citizen complaint um, through the City View app online or calls or emails to the utility department. Um, other ways we can find out if there are problems. Uh, we have, as you know, a lot of city staff out there doing work and they can report back to us when they see something that doesn't look right. And then after we identify the problem, uh, staff has to go out and verify that it's actually happening, notify the party that is having that issue. Um, and then usually there will be some kind of follow-up or reinspection to ensure that the problem was fixed. And then uh, that also can involve escalating enforcement, uh, depending on the situation and level of cooperation with the party. And in some cases, uh, can even lead to civil penalties. And our process is, is fairly the same uh, with a few different variations. Um, just to highlight, I guess, um, you know, the, the initial verification and notification, we we give folks every chance we can, um, you know, whether it's uh, trying different types of contact, uh, a soft letter, we call it. So a mailed notification, an email, a phone call, a site visit, you know, talking to a property manager or, uh, or a tenant. Um, we try to give them uh, every every chance we can um, to get resolution prior to kind of following the, the more regulatory pathway. Uh, so the NOV is kind of that first official notice of violation where a fine amount is talked about um, or mentioned uh, in this uh, process. And then the final NOV, um, you know, it basically reiterates that, hey, we've given you so many chances, so many inspections to take care of the issue. Here's your potential fine. Um, unless you take care of it. And even then they get another uh, reinspection before that would ever uh, result in a penalty. So it's it's quite a, it can be a lengthy process sometimes, uh, but by the end of it, they know what the issue is and we've tried to assist and, and help them resolve it. 
So across both of these code systems, to, to date, the focus has really been on customer education first, getting the word out, raising awareness that these codes exist. Um, and then, as Dan mentioned, doing everything possible to, to help uh, that individual resolve it themselves, uh, rather than using the fine as the, you know, the motivation to make that change. So the, the questions that we were curious uh, to circle back with with this group is just to spend a little more time on that thought. Um, you know, and, and the best ways to communicate with customers about enforcement of, of these regulations and thinking about some of the different types of, of land use. There's obviously large landowners, there's multifamily and single family residential. There might be some nuances in your recommendations uh, depending on those different audiences. Um, and we also, uh, you know, wanted to acknowledge that during construction, there might be some different types of conversations there. There's inspections and permits and other things that are um, built into that program versus after construction, once those are installed, you know, it's more homeowners and property managers who are going to be the recipients of that, uh, that communication or the ones able to take action. Um, and we were also interested in kind of just circling back, you know, thinking about all those different customer education tools for both stormwater and water conservation that we talked about in January. Um, you know, which ones do you think are the best, best use of city staff time and, and resources and what, what's gonna be most effective and can be prioritized? Um, so I am going to take the slides down again here um, and uh, drop these in the chat. We can talk a little bit. The other thing that we wanted to do was just um, give a quick demo of the mural space in case folks haven't dipped your toe into that, uh, that work area. We do have some notes collecting there. And so I'll, I'll save a little time for that as well. All right. So any thoughts on talking with customers about enforcement, these codes. Everything from design through maintenance. <laughs> Sorry. And Molly, you had a, a thought there as well? <laughs> uh, it, it seems like those two options you just had on the screen of during construction or after installation, those are both too late in, in my opinion. Um, you know, I'm, I'm finally working with a developer that's, um, you know, being involved in the very front part of things where if we, if we designed the, the drainage <laughs> in the right way, you know, it's so easy to build a successful landscape after that. But if they already have the, the gutters piped to a wrong direction, you know, you basically have to tear everything up to do it right again. And so you see so much stormwater, like, meh, you know, like, oh, we don't get that much rain. It's not that big of a deal. But, you know, in the big picture, it is because if I can get all the gutters and bring them to one place and create a swale, then that, you know, has, has some potential to feed the landscape. Like all this precipitation we got in January, you know, that could have fed the, you know, the deciduous trees and, you know, like it, there's a benefit there, but if, if it's not part of the original design and intent of that project, you can't change that, that infrastructure there is um, a costly renovation that'll, it'll never happen. So we got to be in the, we got to be in the, at the, you know, as possible. Yes, yes. That, that is such a good point, and it's such a hard one. Is how do you get people knowledgeable in advance? Um, you know, most I've folks been, don't want to read a big manual. Yeah, I've been picking on this designer for two years, and I or this builder that he already had a designer, and I'm like, just you know, once you get an opportunity, uh, you know, I'd be happy to work with you, and kind of, you know, finally getting in that, and you know, now I have a feeling that we'll, we're going to be able to create an example that he's going to be able to go and use with the rest of his builds that he does. And, but, you know, like going back to Corey's point of, you know, having that example that people can visualize themselves in it and like that can work for me and I can see myself there. That's why I think it'd be so fun to go back to some successful projects that are already installed around town and we can bring light to those and you know not everyone is going to be like the the desert rain project but like are there some more that are a little bit more you know tangible for the everyday person to you know because to it's not that expensive to create a swale that functions you know like if you're doing it from a blank slate but if you're trying to retrofit it it's you know going to be cost prohibitive so that's my two cents no that, that's a good point molly so 
if we had examples, I, I think, you know, uh, one of the things that we're thinking about with the code, um, uh, private development code is, you know, having those resources available at like the pre-con meeting. So expectations are kind of set up front of, you know, here's the code, um, you know, here's the resources to help you kind of decipher all that, right? Maybe even some examples um, for those that don't want to read the manual, right? Um, is there anything else? I mean, what what do you think would be the most beneficial? I mean, the uh, certainly like examples around town, if we can bring homeowners or contractors or have workshops or tours, right? That's that's beneficial, right? We're kind of addressing uh, the industry or some stakeholders, you know, for developers. Um, yeah, are there like, any key you know, pieces? We have, we have the tour of homes every year because everyone's looking inside and wants to see all that, but let's, you know, sure. to kind of bring, and I think that might've happened back in the day at one point, there were, you know, more kind of tour, tour of landscapes and tour of, you know, Xeriscape landscapes that function or, you know, um, an, an opportunity there because to, you know, yeah, get that hands-on experience. That would be, a, I think that yeah. would be a great way to out, outreach to people. Cause even if some people didn't get a chance to attend, hopefully there's documentation. Uh, it could be, you know, I, I check out your guys' YouTube uh, channel. There's really good stuff on there. I mean, there's some really funny things about conserving water in the restaurant business and such. I mean, that was a goofy video. And so I think, you know, you've already got kind of a, a way to get people's attention about it. Um, so if we can't get them there in person, we can we can share it other ways as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think the master gardeners still do a garden tour every year. I mean, we could we could figure but, out ways to. But one that's actually focused on, on a functional, you know, For storm sure. stormwater and irrigation. So yeah, like you know, the flowers are great, but let's talk about the water part that makes this. Yeah, you know, now I'm sure. thinking sometimes it's easier to to work with something that's created than add a section to it, right? Or then then try to build something new. Um, but I like that idea. I think um, positive recognition is one of those things that we were trying to think, and a lot of it. And maybe this is you know getting to that point of like, well, how do we get the focus, or how how do we get the attention? Because you know we have. Um, a contractor newsletter that goes out quarterly and granted it's not a huge audience i think we got 120 people on there but every single issue we're asking please like send us examples of something that you've done that you know has achieved conservation or that you're proud of you know and we'll highlight them we'll we'll do the promotion of it and i think you were like one of the only ones that got back to us so i'm like great <laughs> i love you molly Where's everybody else, right? You know, and so I think that's what we're struggling with is, um, you know, uh, across the industry, the same interest is not there, and and um, yeah, so that, I guess that's what we're we're a little frustrated with, you know, and maybe that maybe that is a bigger incentive, right? If they get to have their company sign out front of the home that everybody's touring and they get to be on site talking about, you know. Uh, their business or their designs, um, maybe that that is more of an incentive. But so my worry about that is is um, th I think those are super cool. I also worry that we're attracting the you know the the choir right <laughs> um, versus you know how you get out to the other folks. I know Dan and I uh, have talked a little bit about I, I don't know developing templates for things like making it simple for people and having some one pagers, it won't be anything creative, but, you know, here's a little example of a residential lot with, um, you know, only a tiny bit of lawn on it. And, you know, maybe we could also, I, maybe we should be combining these, right? And then having the, you know, disconnected downspout feature along with it too. Um, we're, we're doing a template like that for erosion control, actually, for single family houses, just like, Here's the basic measures you put in that could just be handed out and signed by the person at the counter getting a permit for for a single house versus these bigger projects that we focus our time on. Um, I I don't know. I just, yeah. I, I think we need both. Right? 
Yeah. I think those are important. Um, you know, we've seen at least on the capital project side, you know, outside, um, you know, architecture firms from outside the region come in and start specking things. And we're like, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, where, where are you getting these plants from? Or, you know, that's not how we do blowouts here. So we can't put that there, right? So we're able to catch those sort of things. So maybe that resource packet, you know, those examples that you're talking about, Lori, um, you know, we have the local expertise to pull that together. Uh, that's something we're, we're trying to work on right now. Um, you know, I guess uh, I'm thinking, what else do we need to provide them uh, aside from doing everything ourselves? And how do we get them in the right hands? Yeah. Too? I see Mark has Mark. his hand raised. Yeah, I think I'm um, taking a little bit of a pivot, but I, I think the city has so much good capacity to detect certain kinds of code violations that you should be explicit about that. You should say that, you know, basically say we know for these kinds of violations when they occur in um, sort of deterrence and, um, you know, not to go too far in economic theory, it's really the probability of enforcement times the magnitude of the penalty. And everyone always thinks about just make the penalty worse. But really what we found is that high expectation around receiving a penalty of some sort is the strongest deterrent. And there's there's the two pieces to it in terms of detection and then enforcement. And I know the city's not always converting every detection into a penalty, but at least letting people know, hey, they're, they know that we are um, violating these codes and maybe not mention explicitly that there are some other codes we can't detect as well, but just so people are aware, you're probably going to get caught. Yeah. No, that's that's a good point, Mark. I, we've always been like so hesitant of like trying not to be too big brotherish. <laughs> like we, you know, we I think we worded it delicately, like our records show that you may be watering outside of irrigation hours because um, you know, like for instance, the portal is great, right? If someone logs in, they can see hourly water use and they can send us an email that we'll get right away, right? And ask us questions. It's like we were always kind of like timid to how much do we tell them we can see right versus uh because we're going to tell santa claus and you're yeah. going to get coal <laughs> yeah but that's uh yeah i think that's a, a reality of creating that awareness though right yeah i mean you have to know and, and i, I think I've been, yeah yeah so, sorry um just because i i think i've mentioned before that epa has found huge success where they're not even including a penalty, just letting uh, people know that they are violating something with stormwater codes, um, um, TSCA, the Toxic Substance Control Act, in terms of uh, reporting what releases are, just knowing that um, it's not a secret what you're doing has almost as much effect on behavior as actual penalties. Huh. Interesting. Is there like a paper or something on that? Yeah, yeah, I've done a lot of work on this. I could send you some stuff, Lori. That'd be awesome. Any other ideas come to mind? Things that you think work well right now or that you'd like to see, you know, expanded? Any gaps in terms of communicating with customers? Y yes. Mark, you probably saw that. If you can share the uh, any resources with the, with the group where we can make sure that they're included in the next packet or or so forth. Yeah, I love that the psychology of it. <laughs> so I think just personally, you know, there's a lot of um, like in uh, customer surveys and stuff that we've done people when you're also giving people a chance, they can have water smart and they can make their own decisions too when they see that. I mean, there, there are some personal controls that you can you can uh, take action on. It's not just big brother and you don't know what's going on with your own system. Just to follow up as um, if, if, you know, in talking, we want to facilitate more as far as the demonstration site or gardens go. Um, I would I would be able to provide some feedback with the High Desert Garden Tour because we've been doing that for a long time. And just the, um, the interest in the comments we get back every year from that tour in relation to wanting to see 
all native plants or water wise, we always get that feedback. And we, we have homes that, in fact, Rick's home was one of the homes we've included before on that. Um, but the challenge there lies in, you know, I can't push a button and have six native plant homes side by side on a garden tour. It's getting the homes. The challenge is getting the homes, finding the homes and getting the homes. So we'd almost be better off. You know, I'm thinking a little bit more about if we really want to do a demonstrative site to have a public space to do that in. We've got a couple examples right now, but I'm wondering if there's a small structure that you set up that's like a pseudo home and you do interpretive signs around it and that sort of thing, like they have, for example, at the Oregon Garden. I don't know if you're familiar with the fire safe home. It's actually a legitimately sized home. Uh, and and with interpretive signs around it. And so something like that might be a better example and have public access access for everybody. But anyway, just if if you wanna have more in-depth conversations about those types of demonstrations, we have some experience there that I could, I uh, would like to be a part of those conversations and, and help if I can. Uh, one quick thought. Um, I don't know if we have any developers on the call. I can't see everyone, but I mean, what about, you know, um, one of the model homes, you know, as an example, right? If we have this new code, I mean, that's something that I think. I think Jeff's on the call. Is he? Yeah, I was trying to find my mute button. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's something we can certainly look into. Yeah, that's a, yeah, obviously a great opportunity to, for us to participate in that. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And then and then we'll look for that one that everybody we can use like reoccurringly too, Amy Joe. You know, that would be where where is that firewise house, Amy Joe? What the uh the fire safe mm -hmm. house is fire safe. it's at the Oregon Garden in Silverton. Okay. So it's not a public gardens, but you know, that's why I'm thinking it it'd be nice. You can do it on private homes, but eventually they're private, right? And maybe those homes get sold and you have you have some challenges there with it being private property versus a public space. Sure. Where everyone can visit to see. Dan, um, one thought comes to mind is the city's uh, new building that we're developing. And that may be an opportunity where we could do something like this on a public piece of property. Yep, exactly, Elizabeth. So we're going to be meeting here shortly with the architecture team that's working on the, the city's going to be building a new public works facility. It's going to combine utilities, transportation and mobility and engineering into one site at kind of the north end of town, the Juniper Ridge area. And uh, Dan and I have been trying hard <laughs> To, to make sure that that site is developed in a way that it can be used as some sort of classroom type example. Um, if people have ideas they'd like to share with us, um, Dan and I do have a meeting coming up soon uh, to participate. I'm, I'm trying to remember, Elizabeth, if you're on that too, I need to make sure. But um, uh any thoughts that people want to share either here or on the mural board or just sending us stuff like, hey, do this or love to help or what, whatever, right, would be would be awesome. This also makes me think about, I don't know what folks think about this, but um, most of my experience has been over in the Portland area. But um, so this is a little bit different example, but um, Clean Water Services, which is a regional storm and sanitary district there, um, offers like streamside property owners, actually I think any property owners, they'll give them a, like a few native plants. Um, and it makes me wonder about us finding a way if we get people to like some of these demonstration sites or something, I don't know, we'd have to get maybe more people growing native plants over here. Uh, but, um, you know, should we find ways to offer to, to give people a certificate or something and get a, a few free native plants to start them off and some little flyers about how you could use them to um, remove lawn and plant them or, you know, disconnect a downspout and, and plant them type stuff, put them in your next to the street, whatever. Um, so I don't know what folks think about that. I'd have to look into um, 
the cost of that, but um, may, maybe it creates a market to to grow more native plants. I mean, I other than Rick's place, it it's it's hard to find a place to get native plants around here, <laughs> except going out in the forest and digging them up, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'd be happy to work with you on that, Lori. That's a great idea. And get involved in the juniper, the design for the juniper ridge. You bet. Ryan. Ryan. Hey, sorry, I've been so quiet. Um, I'm, I have a lot of great ideas. Uh, I was just thinking um, Benton County in Corvallis has kind of a cool educational stormwater treatment facility in front of their building um, and with you know signage and, and I think they do use it for for school tours so it could be worth if anyone goes through Corvallis or so it's not city of Corvallis it's the Benton County building it is so it's Gordon Kurtz uh, who runs that program but it, it's it's really cool oh, so I think cool. stuff like that is very valuable thanks yeah you bet Awesome. Well, we have just over 10 minutes left. See, um, no problem if you have to pop out early. We appreciate everybody's time, but we did want to take just a few minutes here at the end. Um, we're going to do a, a quick summary, but we also wanted, I was just going to share my screen and uh, do a couple of, introduce a couple of things in the mural space, which is going to be something that will stay alive throughout our conversations this year. So uh, show you guys what's set up there if you haven't visited recently. Um, make sure everybody feels comfortable and uh, take a minute here. You can add, uh, try out the tools, add something in um, based on the conversation today. So uh, first I'm going to share my screen um, and then I'll pop the link in the chat so that you can visit the space yourself. It's uh, strange to try to do this on two screens at once. So um, once I give you the, the hyperlink, uh, as I said, it's going to stay the same throughout our conversation. So you can revisit at any point. You can move around the space, um, you know, add, add a fresh thought, like something that somebody else contributed. Um, once you click the link, you can join as a, a visitor, a guest, you get an, an animal, um, or you can add your name, either is fine. There's, you know, it's free, cost to you, nothing. Um, in the space, there's a couple of ways to move around. You can use uh, what's called the outline, um, which is this little uh, stacked set of things. And it's gonna show up here on the right side of your screen. And if we have this set up so you can jump straight to the meeting conversation and you'll see kind of a box. So February conversation, um, you can see, you know, zoom in to, to question one or to question two. And this is all just clicking the buttons in the outline. So one quick way to move around in the space. The other way is just to use, if you've got a scroll bar on your mouse, you can zoom in or out. You can click and drag um, in the space. So a couple ways to move around. Um, there's also this little panel down at the bottom where you can zoom in or out. And then to add content, pretty easy. Um, if you haven't tried this out, we do have a couple of sample notes that you can grab and you can just, you know, once you click on it, you can start uh, say whatever comes to your mind. Uh, just click and type, or you can just double click anywhere in the space and it's gonna create a little sticky note. And you can start, you know, adding your uh, brilliant notions here. Um, and you can also go over to the left panel, and there's some options of what you can add. And you can, you know, click your favorite color sticky. You can change the color. You can change the shape. You can, you know, get very creative if you so desire. You can also click on this lovely little llama, and you can add a like a thumbs up from the left if you think somebody else's idea is brilliant. Um, you know, lots of ways to, to play and have fun, but uh, mostly we just wanted to make sure that everybody is comfortable with uh, accessing this space. And I was going to mention a couple of the other resources. We're trying to keep a running list of acronyms uh, since we have the, the SIMP and the SWAMP and the WMCP and, uh, you know, NPDES and everything else. Uh, so there's acronyms here. There's a quick thing about the role of this group. Um, there's some mural tips in case you forget anything with my uh, name and numbers, you can get access and then some quick links. So you can go straight to uh, the UPAG webpage that's on the city site. 
you can go to learn more about the water conservation stuff to that main page or to the stormwater main page, and we can build this out over time. So I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen here. So the, the cool thing we're thinking about this, and this is something we're just we're trying out and see how this works. But what I, I think is really cool about it is that this is a it's like a little running notebook of all the things we're doing on this committee. And you can go back and see, you know, the past months, what we've what we've talked about. You get links to all the information. Um, this is the way we're kind of taking notes is through this. Um, so it's kind of building the story over time of this group. Um, and then that way, if you miss a meeting, you, you this is this is a way to go into this site and you can uh, get updated information about what what happened and you can even add more. You could add a, a thought if you think about something after the meeting like, oh, you should talk to these folks. You can you can always get a hold of us other ways, but you can add it here and then we have kind of this permanent way of saving the information. So, I'm I'm just I'm really hopeful for this, um, and I'm hoping people will find it comfortable to add information. We're not putting this on our city web page, so it's not like the general public's not going to see this. They're not going because I don't know what would happen to it. <laughs> but um, so this is really just our our little collective group team here is uh, uh, us talking to each other this way. Does this feel you know thumbs up? Pretty comfortable. Any, any questions? Any uh, tech things, issues happening? You can click into the link and try it out right now. Oh, um, I see Barb on there. She's the panda. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> is, is the like the introductions we did? Is that still part of? Is it on this page yet too? I didn't it, know if I I saw it. It isn't. Okay. Um, I did have a separate a separate space, but I still have that uh, accessible too, so I could migrate it into this. this it share. would be so, it would be nice to have yeah, that here too, because call. we have such an amazing group of, of professionals in so many different um, backgrounds. Like the stuff Mark you were saying today just kind of blew my mind. Like that's not even on my register or radar at all. So it's so fun to bring all this together and just be reminded of who everyone is and you know why they're a part. It's a great this. idea. We'll make that happen. And if you know if there's a, an easy hyperlink or something that you want to add that is a resource for others on the group to appreciate, you know that's that's something that can be um, contributed by anybody uh, on the team as well. And it helps us. I, I, you know, I'll be taking some, adding some notes based on the conversations we've had, just to kind of crystallize the input that you guys have provided on these different questions. Um, and when we send out the follow up email, you know that'll include kind of a. A, a snapshot of what we think we heard so that you can say yes that's definitely it or no I had this other thought that I wanted to you know clarify or uh, add into the conversation. All right um, so with just five minutes left I think I'm gonna uh, go ahead and just I'll pull up my screen here you you got a few emails from uh, from me uh, related to our calendar of events moving forward. So uh, just a, a quick preview, um, our next meeting is going to be the first Wednesday, March 1st, and that's going to be water conservation and stormwater management. Um, we're going to uh, get a little advice on applying outdoor water conservation codes and standards to public rights away. So this was something that we, we touched on a little bit today already. Um, and also introduce some of the um, upcoming stormwater conversations uh, that will be happening throughout the year. So sharing a bit of information on that. Um, the, the, you know, the meeting after that is going to be water conservation focused, and then we've got a, a May 10th meeting, and I wanted to point this one out. I do need to make a, a quick change on the calendar. That is not the first Wednesday. We're hoping that folks are going to be comfortable if we switch to the second Wednesday because there's a conference and our, our uh, city team is going to be otherwise occupied. So um, I haven't made that change on the, um, the invite, the Microsoft Outlook invite yet, but wanted to give folks a heads up that we're hoping that's comfortable to make that shift. Same time, just the second Wednesday instead of the first Wednesday. Yeah, the American Public Works Association conference is in Bend that first week of May. So a lot of folks will be attending that. And I'm actually one of the co-chairs for that. So, and so is, uh, so is Tom. Um, so yeah, if we can change that, that would be awesome. And then we did go ahead and cancel. There were, you know, in the series, the two invites where we were planning to take a summer break, give you guys, you know, a chance to get your traveling and everything else uh, in the mix, and then we'll reconvene in, in the fall. So in uh, June, uh, we're talking about doing a field trip. So um, 
we don't want to we don't want to take more than this amount of time for people so we're, what we're what we're trying to put our heads around is like finding some place in the city to go and talk about all these topics we've been talking about but you know kick the tires you know touch things so uh, it's you know we're thinking maybe maybe a, a newer development site um you know we have some folks well folks have left but um that might be able to help us with one of their developments, something like that. Or anyways, any thoughts about a cool place to visit where we can talk about good and the bad of, of both, you know, stormwater, water quality and water conservation management, you know, this kind of landscape uh, approach. Um, plus it's an opportunity for us to, to talk to each other in person. So I'm hoping people will be excited about that. Uh, I'll make sure there's food there too. <laughs> it always motivates me anyways. I don't know about you guys, but um, so any thoughts, please share with us about ideas for that. We'll be, we'll be working towards that for June and we'll try to order up good weather. Or maybe it'll rain and we'll see stuff happen. <laughs> big, big 15 minute dump. <laughs> Awesome. Um, any final thoughts from the city team before we close out today? I just wanted to say thank you for all these great ideas, everybody, and for uh, for listening to us again. I know we're, we're still heavy on the talking to you, but uh, it's always great to hear your feedback and, and uh, you know, your perspective on this. So uh, that's what we're here for. Um, so thank you. Thank you yes. for your time today. We really appreciate it. So. Great. Well, enjoy the day, everyone, and we will see you back next month. Any questions in between, reach out. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.